straight ahead on Law & Crime Daily. Jury selection begins in the Pike County Massacre. Some of these jurors even start off reversing the presumption of innocence. And disgraced attorney Alex Murdoch returns to a South Carolina courtroom as attorneys argue over the evidence prosecutors say connects the defendant to the 2021 murders of his wife and son. Plus, was this jury able to reach a unanimous verdict on all 11 counts in this case? Yes, sir. A verdict is handed down in Florida in the kidnapping and attempted murder trial of Trevor Summers. And later, a closer look at the Parkland school shooter's childhood years. He didn't really blend in with the other students. He stayed apart on, in the classroom. Law & Crime Daily, covering court cases from coast to coast. Welcome everyone to Law & Crime Daily. I'm your host, Mike Sachs, in for Brian Buckmeyer. Now, the final phase of jury selection is underway for one of the Wagner family members charged in the Pike County Massacre. George Wagner IV is accused of conspiring with his brother and parents to murder eight members of the Rodin and Gilly families in April 2016. Law and Crime's Anjanette Levy is in Pike County, Ohio, with the story. Seventy prospective death-qualified jurors reported to the Pike County Courthouse on Monday morning. This is where final jury selection is beginning. Death qualified means it's already been determined that these jurors are willing to implement the death penalty if it's warranted. So the final jury of 12 will be selected from this final 70. Cameras are not allowed in the courtroom for this process. George Wagner IV was in court with his lawyers, picking the jury that will determine whether he's guilty of conspiring to murder eight members of the Roden family and Hannah Gilly. His lawyers wanted the entire panel stricken. In a motion, Wagner's lawyers said that working class jurors had been excused, citing financial hardship, which was discriminatory and not fair to Wagner, and that the panel of 70 skewed heavily toward women. 51 of the 70 are women, 19 are men. Judge Deering denied the motion. The defense wants somebody who's not gonna automatically think just because somebody's charged, that means they're guilty. Jury consultant Alan Turkheimer said Wagner's lawyers may look for someone who's had a family member who was wrongfully accused or had a negative experience with the justice system. As for the state. A good juror for the prosecution is somebody who defers to authority, somebody who thinks that too many defendants get off because of technicalities in the law. They believe that if somebody is charged, they're probably guilty. The Roden and Gilly murder investigation is the largest in Ohio's history with four crime scenes. The probe took investigators from Ohio to Alaska and Montana. Jake Wagner and his mother, Angela, are testifying against George and his father, Billy. Jake and Angela said in court that they carried out the murders so that the family could have full custody of the daughter he shared with Hannah Roden. After the jurors are seated, they will be taken to the four crime scenes where the Rodens and Hannah Gilly were murdered. They will also be taken to other locations that were searched during the investigation. For Law and Crime Daily, I'm Anjanette Levy. Joining us today is co-host Terry Austin and criminal defense attorney Nicole DeBoer. Now, Nicole, it's not often that jurors have an opportunity to visit the crime scenes. So how do you think this will affect the jurors on the case? I think it'll weigh heavily on them. It will have the effect on them of being where the crime occurred, obviously, which is very emotional. They'll have an opportunity to be in the same location, breathe the same air, really feel the presence of all of the things that ultimately will be talked about in court. I think viewing the crime scene in a case like this can have a huge impact, uh, usually in favor of the prosecution. Yeah, and Terry, two of the four Wagners have already admitted to their involvement in the crime. How do you think that will affect this trial? It's going to have a huge impact, Mike, because, listen, those two individuals are the mother and brother, and they're testifying against George and the father. And so I think when you have two family members testifying against two others, it's really going to make the jury stop and think, listen, this has to have happened the way they are saying it happened. It's an odd set of circumstances for four people to conspire to kill eight people, but that's exactly what happened here. And now they're all pitted against each other. And I do think because Jake is cooperating, if they get a conviction against George and ultimately father, then they will be spared the lives. And so I think that the evidence is very, very strong. I think they will get a conviction here. I absolutely think they should probably do a plea deal because of all of the evidence against them. It's a waste of the county's money, frankly, at this point. But we'll see what happens. 
Yeah, Terry, you had mentioned spared lives, right? right? Because I believe Jake, he's spared his own death penalty in this case for, for life in prison, successive, uh, successive sentences. Whereas here, George IV it might be risking his own life with the death penalty should he ultimately be convicted. So it is a fascinating, potential big deal of a case. Of course, it's already moving forward. Jury selection is happening. And we're going to see where it's going to go. We will be covering it on Law & Crime as well. Now, I do want to turn to OnlyFans model and Instagram influencer Courtney Clark. Plenty. She's back in Florida being held without bond over the April murder of her boyfriend Christian Obumselli. Now, Clenny, known as Courtney Taylor to her more than 2 million social media followers, was in court for a first appearance Saturday in Miami. Her attorneys arguing there is not probable cause for a second degree murder charge. Now, Clenny is accused of stabbing Obumselli to death in their Miami apartment April 3rd, though she initially said she threw the knife at her boyfriend. Prosecutors argue Obumselli's injuries suggest the knife was powerfully thrust downward, which sliced a key artery near his heart. Clenny's claiming the stabbing was done in self defense. The couple's relationship was reportedly constantly abusive. Officials released a video of the two in an elevator shortly after Clenny's arrest in Hawaii of the model hitting Obumselli. Now, Clenny is set to be in court for an arraignment on Wednesday. Switching now to sports legal news, where Buffalo Bills punter Matt Ariza is released amidst an ongoing gang rape lawsuit. Over the weekend, it was announced that Ariza would be released from the team just two days after a civil lawsuit was filed against the punter. According to the lawsuit, Ariza and two of his former San Diego State teammates raped a then 17-year-old high school senior back in October 2021. The lawsuit alleges a then 21-year-old Ariza took the girl to an off-campus party at his home, where she was raped for an hour and a half. The three men are accused of rape, gender violence, and false imprisonment. On Friday, Ariza released a statement reading in part, quote, The facts of the incident are not what they are portrayed in the lawsuit or in the press. I look forward to quickly setting the record straight. In more NFL news, Washington Commanders running back Brian Robinson Jr. is shot in what police are calling a possible attempted robbery or carjacking. It happened on Sunday in Washington, D.C. Officials say two suspects ran off after the shooting and officers later recovered a firearm nearby. A spokesperson for the Metropolitan Police Department says Robinson suffered two gunshot wounds to his lower extremities and was taken to a local hospital for treatment. A statement released by the Washington Commanders reads in part, quote, he sustained non-life-threatening injuries and is currently being treated at the hospital where team officials are on site with him. We ask that you respect Brian's privacy at this time. Now, still ahead on Law & Crime Daily, just hours after the defendant presents his own closing argument, a Florida jury hands down a verdict. But first, disgraced attorney Alec Murdoch appears back in a South Carolina courtroom as lawyers argue over the evidence which led to murder charges for the deaths of his wife and son. Welcome back. Disgraced South Carolina attorney Alec Murdoch back in court Monday for a hearing involving the murder charges and the 2021 deaths of his wife Maggie and their son Paul. This comes after Murdoch was charged in his wife and son's murders last month, more than a year after they were shot and killed on the family's property. The investigation into their deaths led to a slew of investigations into the disbarred lawyer's finances. He now faces more than 80 charges for alleged schemes to defraud former clients of more than $8 million. Earlier this month, Murdoch's defense attorneys requested prosecutors disclose the evidence against their client, claiming they'd received none of it, which was delaying and hindering their legal defense. A South Carolina judge ruled all evidence must be shared with the defense, but issued a protective order saying the defense is restricted from releasing or sharing any of that information. Now, before the ruling, the hearing erupted into a shouting match between the defense and the prosecutors. We're here for the state's motion. Objection, Your Honor, we're not here for that. We're here for the defense motion to compel. And I object to the state trying to hijack this proceeding. We filed this motion weeks after they failed to comply with Rule 5 and Brady. And you should ignore that. I think that's a disservice to this court and the criminal justice system. The only reason why they Your Honor, I'm not done. If I could be heard without being interrupted, and hijacked hijack by the, the state as they continue to try to hide the ball on this case. I'm sorry if I appear upset, but I can tell you that every time we turn around, they're trying to hide something. My client 
As of now, a trial date is set for January 2023, but Terry Alec Murdoch has been accused of multiple crimes, but the most serious, of course, is the murder of his wife and son. So what do you think was his motive? You know, I think that is the million dollar question. I think he's killed them because he's covering up other crimes. Remember, there were lots of bodies found in and around him. Stephen Smith, that's the one I think people don't really recall. He was a 19 year old. His body was found not too far from their home in 2015. Then, of course, the person who worked on their estate, Gloria Satterfield, she was the former housekeeper. Her body, she died in 2018, and they said that that was an accident. And then Mallory Beach died, and she died in a boat that was driven by Paul, the son. So I do think that he probably killed his wife and son because he's trying to cover up these other crimes. Maybe they knew about it. Obviously, Paul was involved in the killing or the death of Mallory Beach. And plus, he's got all these other charges, the fraud, the money laundering, the forgery. And I'm sure he had conversations with his wife, and so perhaps he thought he could silence her in that way. So I think it's to cover up all of the other things that he's now currently dealing with with these charges. Bodies everywhere. This is some Baroque stuff. Still, of course, innocent until proven guilty. Nicole, the defendants accused of multiple crimes, including embezzlement and now murder. So there's so much here. Is there something where an insanity defense could come into play? I think it's definitely possible. I mean, look, you know, these are his own family members that he's accused of killing, his child, his wife. Um, and whatever the reason, uh, if it's true that he didn't indeed kill these individuals, there can't be a good one. And there has to be some sort of mental defect here that plays a part into what he was thinking or exactly what it was he was trying to accomplish here. So it's definitely possible. Yeah, in January 2023, again, is when the trial is set to begin. The lawyers are already at each other's throats. It seems perhaps uh, going to be a contentious one moving forward. But still coming up on Law and Crime Daily, it's week two of the defense's case in the Parkland School Shooter Penalty Phase trial. Plus, a verdict is handed down in the Florida trial of Trevor Summers after representing himself against the charges of kidnapping and attempted murder of his estranged wife. Welcome back. A Florida jury returns a guilty verdict all across the board after a week of testimony in the case of Trevor Summers, who represented himself against kidnapping and attempted murder charges. Summers was found guilty late Friday night of kidnapping, attempted murder, sexual battery, child neglect, grand theft of a motor vehicle, and violating a domestic violence injunction. In March of 2017, he was accused of holding his estranged wife, Elisa Mathewson, captive in her own home and in the backseat of her SUV for three days. During that time, he attempted to kill her twice, once with a pillow and a second time with a rope. Summers was also charged with child neglect after asking his then 14-year-old daughter to open a window at Elisa's house so he could get in and having her drive her four siblings to his house 12 miles away. He faces a possible sentence of life in prison. His sentencing is set for October. Late Friday night, the verdicts for all 11 counts were read in court. We, the jury, find as follows as to count one. The defendant is guilty of attempted murder in the first degree. That's to count two. The defendant is guilty of attempted in the first degree. That's to count three. The defendant is guilty of kidnapping as charged. That's to count four. The defendant is guilty of sexual battery by a person 18 or older upon a victim 18 or older as charged. That's to count five. The defendant is guilty of sexual battery. That's to count six. The defendant is guilty of child neglect as charged. That's to count 10. The defendant is guilty of grand theft motor vehicle as charged. That's to count 11. The defendant is guilty of violation of domestic violence injunction as charged. So say we all. Guilty on all counts. Now, Nicole, defendants, of course, have the right to self-representation, but do you think the judge should have allowed Summers to cross-examine his wife? You know, if a person is representing themselves, they get to do the things that a lawyer would ordinarily get to do. I will say, as we have heard from these verdicts, uh, the jury doesn't usually like it. Uh, when the accused is questioning people uh, who are victimized by the conduct in question. And, you know, a lot of times they even, in jury selection, question 
potential jurors who I have seen recoil at this sort of behavior. So generally a terrible idea, a person who represents a fool for a lawyer, no question. Yeah, and Terry, the jury then, of course, found Summers guilty on all counts as charged. Do you think they got it right here? Oh, that all-male jury got it absolutely right, no doubt about it. I wasn't worried so much about the kidnapping and attempted murder charge. I thought that listening to Elisa's story might have that charge come back guilty. The child neglect also, because as you mentioned, Mike, he had his 14-year-old drive over 20 minutes to a destination of his home, and frankly, that's dangerous. But I was a little bit worried about the grand theft auto. I thought that they might think that it was a car, it was driven by the husband at some point in time, so it wasn't theft. But as it turned out, they believed her story entirely. He violated that domestic violence injunction and he sexually battered her. And she said that on the stand, she was adamant that he raped her. She said, this is the very definition of rape. You broke into my home, you woke me up, you forced me, you tied me up. So I thought that that would come back and I'm glad that that jury saw it that way. And I think that it was unanimous on obviously every single count and that was the right decision. Yeah, and it was of course a Hail Mary for the representation for himself when it came to cross-examining his ex-wife. But of course the jury could have found Similarly, had his lawyer also gone for the cross-examination there as well. So, you know, you would never know which way, which way it went one way or the other, but if we do know how it went in reality, and it was guilty as charged on all 11 counts. Now, when we come back, we head to Florida for the Parkland School Shooter Penalty Phase trial. Hear the testimony from the shooter's elementary school teacher who described his demeanor in his early years. Welcome back. Monday marks the start of week two as the defense presents its case in the Parkland school shooter penalty phase trial. In February 2018, the then 19-year-old gunman opened fire at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School in Florida. 17 people were killed and 17 more injured. In October of last year, the gunman pleaded guilty to all charges. That means it's now up to a Broward County jury to determine whether the defendant is sentenced to life in prison or is given the death penalty. Last week, defense attorneys began their case, focusing on the defendant's troubled childhood and upbringing. On Monday, jurors heard from one of the defendant's elementary school teachers, and she explained he mostly kept to himself, but had violent outbursts. Nicholas was very quiet. He was aloof. He, um, he didn't blend in well um, with the other students. I'm trying to think, uh, anxious, very anxious. He was very much, when he had his belongings in the classroom, he knew where they were, he did not want to share. So those behavioral problems could be um, throwing things, correct? Yes. It could be hitting people, correct? Yes. It could be destroying property. Yes. But we're talking about if they were older, if they were adults, if they were out on the street, those would be crimes, wouldn't they? Hmm. They could be, yes. Okay, because you can't destroy people's property. Right. You can't hit people, right? Correct. So, Nicole, do you think the teacher's testimony there will help the defendant's case? And if so, how? I think that it might. I think that the defense has done an incredible job of trying to personalize Cruz. I mean, so far what the jury knows without the defense case is that Cruz is the monster that committed these horrible, horrible crimes. Uh, and without giving him a childhood and a family and a background, that's all they would ever know. So I think that the defense is very smart to call these witnesses and it is giving us a bigger picture of him as a human being and not just a defendant. Yeah, Terry, because for the last many weeks we've been hearing about how Cruz was, did and thought and, and behaved all sorts of terribly, up, of course, including the murders at, Parkland, uh, at the Parkland High School. But here we're hearing a different side of him, and all the jurors said that they could vote for the death penalty if the evidence supported it. But what are the chances of a unanimous verdict for the death penalty after hearing from the defense? 
You know, saying that you can vote for the death penalty is very different from actually casting those votes. And Nicole is right. When you listen to all of those mitigating factors, it gets difficult at the end of the day. You realize and recognize that he had a very difficult childhood. He didn't get a good start. His mother did not take care of him in the womb. She was on drugs. She was on alcohol. And he didn't act well in class. He had behavioral issues. No one gave him the help that they are all now testifying he truly needed. So I do think that these jurors are listening to that and it's going to have an effect on them, even if in the beginning they thought they could vote for the death penalty. And so the other issue here is some people think that life in prison is worse than the death penalty. And they may say to themselves, look, I was going to vote unanimously for the death penalty, but now I'm thinking these crimes are so horrible, let him just sit in jail. And then there's always the possibility of a stealth juror who told everyone during voir dire, yes, I can vote for the death penalty, but at the end of the day, they had no intention of doing that for personal reasons, which is fine, but you are supposed to excuse yourself for that. Yeah, Terry and Nicole, thank you very much for your commentary here today and your analysis. Well worth listening to everything you had to say. Thank you for joining us here on Law & Crime Daily as well, everyone watching, and we'll see you next time as we discuss justice in America.